My name is Peter Leonard, and I serve as the director for the Digital Humanities Lab at Yale University Library. And I'm very pleased today to be able to welcome all of you to the lecture hall in Sterling Memorial Library for uh, what we hope will be the first of a series of symposia, Beyond Boundaries, Symposium on Hybrid Scholarship at Yale University. This symposium, which was uh, organized between the Yale STEAM Group and the Yale Digital Humanities Lab, um, was mainly organized by Kathy DeRose, our Outreach and Engagement Manager at uh, the Digital Humanities Lab. And we're really excited about bringing all of you in the room today to hear a lot of interesting stories, a lot of interesting projects, a lot of interesting perspectives on the question of hybrid scholarship. I think what's most exciting to me about today's events is that you're going to hear from Yaleys at all stages, at all uh, sections of the life cycle. You're going to see here some senior professors talking about what hybrid scholarship, digital humanities, and STEM and arts and humanities means to them. You're going to hear, I'm going to see some presentations from postdocs. You're going to see work from graduate students, as well as some really exciting work from students in Yale College, the newest scholars that Yale has welcomed onto campus. Um, as I mentioned before, this event is co-sponsored by the Digital Humanities Lab and the Yale STEAM Group. And I'm actually uh, delighted to be able to announce a gift from Barbara and Rich Frankie, class of 1953, who have, of course, been outstanding supporters of Yale's libraries for decades. And the reason I want to recognize them today is that their most recent generosity will ensure that the Digital Humanities' new home on the ground floor of Sterling Library um, will uh, be a space that encourages exactly the type of collaboration across disciplines and methodologies that you're going to see um, in today's presentation. So uh, we are so happy that Rich and Barbara are here today, and we're very thankful for their support of this type of work. With that, I'm going to turn us over to the first of our events today, which is a, uh, well, yes, that's, thank you. There's no better way to recognize uh, their generosity than to go right into a series of exciting lightning talks of the types of scholarship that we hope the Digital Humanities Lab can be successful in supporting, and we know that the undergraduate STEAM group is excited about. So we're going to hear from a suite of presenters. I'm going to introduce them by name only. They're going to tell you their affiliations and their research projects, and we're starting alphabetically with Anya Adair, who will be giving a seven-minute talk. Thanks very much. The first thing I have to do is, is switch this over and to prove my digital humanities abilities, let's see how I go with doing this. As Peter has said, and I'm a, a fourth year graduate student in the Department of English Language and Literature. And I want to talk to you today about project-based learning, XML and the TEI, and the uses of digital tools to teach traditional kinds of scholarship in a non-traditional way. So to begin with traditional scholarship. Any student wishing to work with the pre-modern material of written culture has a great deal to learn. They have to know Middle English, Old English, some Latin, certainly some French, simply to read the texts. And then there are the basics of paleography, the study of ancient handwriting, and codicology, the study of the codex or manuscript book, both needed to make sense of a manuscript's letter forms and physical features. Reporting on all of this requires reliable transcription and reliable cataloging within the appropriate manuscript conventions. <coughs> Every new artifact demands some new expertise, a little art history for the decoration, linguistics to place a text's particular dialect, a passing acquaintance with <coughs> liturgical cycles to understand a calendar. Manuscript study confronts students with a range of scholarly challenges, often so many challenges that serious work in the field is not undertaken, at least until graduate study, and often quite advanced graduate study 
or even after graduate study through some mysterious and haphazard process of apprenticeship. This is all the work of the textual scholar and editor, someone who can go to a series of dusty manuscripts and reconstruct from them a readable version of the Canterbury Tales. And, yet, and now to new scholarship. Introducing digital manuscript studies, training students in the new digital methods of text encoding is another challenging proposition. Teachers can expect a classroom of students with widely variant prerequisite skill sets. A few students may have worked with XML. Many may not have even heard of HTML. On top of all these, all those other traditional skills that I had on the last slide, it can seem a step too far to jump in and teach students some level of coding before or while they try to master the skills of the textual scholar. Digital editing and the medieval manuscript role is a project-based two-day workshop run by and for graduate and undergraduate students, which seeks to achieve the marriage of digital humanities pedagogy and manuscript studies. And more, it seeks to use the very challenges associated with digital tools to illuminate and make possible the learning of traditional techniques in manuscript study. We throw complete beginners right in at the deep end. Crucially, students in this workshop come together as a team to tackle the challenges they face. Collaboration is at the center of the work. Participants work together to produce an edition of a manuscript role, complete with digital facsimile, transcribed text, and catalogued data. The hands-on approach requires students to apply skills as soon as or while they learn them, and therefore, we hope to learn and remember them more securely. XML, our old friend extensible markup language, is a general language used for marking or tagging data in whatever way the tagger prefers. The TEI, or Text Encoding Initiative, provides a set of humanities-wide guidelines to specify which tags should be used in which textual situations, offering a common scholarly standard for creating machine-readable text for academic purposes. Is the latest iteration of the TEI the quite complex P5, which has a comprehensive manuscript description capacity that we use for our work? Once a text is marked up using the TEI, a style sheet can display, or a query language search, the now information-rich text in a range of ways. Working with a team to transcribe, catalogue, mark up, and design an interface to display encoded text from a manuscript is collaborative digital editing. So the question is, how does adding coding to the learning requirements help us to better learn and better understand the textual culture that is at the center of our study? Before a text can be encoded, Lou Bernard rightly tells us, it must first be decoded. The process of encoding text requires its implicit features, those things we just assume when we look at it, to be made explicit. The same text can be encoded in different ways. For example, one editor might choose to mark the lines of verse, while another might choose to emphasize the lines as they originally appeared on the manuscript page. The decision to mark up a text in one way rather than another depends on the purpose of the edition and the editor's interpretation of what its most important features are. In our workshop, a whole session was devoted to a discussion between participants about how to encode the text they had just transcribed. When you get right down to it, all of this traditional work is about making choices, and having to encode a text forces you to make those choices very precisely. Here, the choice of the text we worked with, a manuscript role, was central. As you can see here, this text is non-standard, it's non-hierarchical, and it's not neat. And as anyone familiar with the XML will know, hierarchy is absolutely at the center of it. And it's certainly at the center of the TEI, which imagines texts to divide neatly into books, and then chapters, and then paragraphs, and then sentences, and then words. So getting students to move right to the editorial stage and to literally mark the text with appropriate tags, working within this system that forces uncomfortable choices to be made, makes starkly clear the intellectual stakes of the work being undertaken. Each of those traditional skills within this new economy becomes a tool to solve a very real and present problem.
And in the urgency of these challenges posed by digital editing tools, the real learning of textual scholarship takes place. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anya. Um, I'd now like to welcome two uh, students up next, uh, Yesul Bion, uh, excuse me, Yesul Bion and Pepe Gomez Acebo. Thank you, Peter. Good morning. Um, so as, as, as Peter said, uh, Yesu and I have been working on a project on the, related with the Yale University Art Gallery, in which we've been trying to create a conceptual map of the different pieces that are exhibited. Um, this initiative comes as part of the student uh, guide program, which both Yesu and I are part of. Um, something that distinguishes this program from, from other student uh, run guides in different museums across the United States is how interdisciplinary our approach is. We do thematic tours and in them we draw a series of connections between our pieces that the general visitor would usually not make. Uh, for example, speaking on my behalf, my tour, I start with an Assyrian relief down in the medieval gallery and then I go up to the contemporary gallery to uh, talk about a sole with wall drawing. Um, so, in thinking of how we could have these connections be made more explicit, um, we sort of were trying to see how we could tag the different pieces in the, in the art museum and create sort of a network in which a visitor could jump from one piece to the other in a less conventional way. Our galleries right now are organized by, in, in, in a very traditional sense, uh, for example, our European galleries organized uh, chronologically. Um, but how could the visitor break through the layout of, of, of the gallery and have an experience that is more in interconnected? The project inherently had three, three phases. The first one was the database. How are we going to create this index? Uh, what tags are we going to give to each work? The second one was, was more related with the visitor. How, how is he going to see it? Uh, how are we going to draw these connections? Is it going to be a network? Is it going to be a tree map? And then finally, the platform, uh, of course, where is it going to reside? Uh, probably an app, probably a, a website. Uh, not in that stage quite yet, though. The hidden, the hidden gem of this project is, is actually in the way that we've, we've uh, gotten these, these tags. Um, the students actually write very lengthy papers on each work. Uh, there is um, conservation reports, uh, there are curatorial files for each piece. And in using a text uh, scanner, we were able to identify the most relevant words. Here for the Van Gogh's Night Cafe, you can see how the top, the top uh, six to seven words are very relevant. Unfortunately, right now we don't have n-gram, so Van Gogh does get cut. Uh, it's something to work on in the later stages. In terms of the visualization though, we have two, we have right now, we're working on two, uh, two options. Here showing an early, uh, early radiation. The, as, as you can see here, we have three pieces highlighted and they're connected by the word religious. For the Assyrian release and for the threshold, um, in the Pacific Gallery, the, we, we did expect to see sort of religious in them. But for Rothko, it wasn't so evident. Uh, which sort of proved that the database component was working and sort of these like unexpected connections were occurring. The powerful part about the um, network sort of visualization um, is that you can sort of jump around very easily. Uh, you can get a sort of broad sense of the gallery, of the different words. The problem is already in this like quick sketch with only five pieces, the network is pretty dense. So in trying to think how the visitor would actually navigate the space in the gallery, or how the visitor in the website would, would look at the, at the different works um, from home, we, we actually are right now working towards sort of a tree map mode of visualization. It would be a two-stage tree map view. Here on the left, a quick mock-up for the Van Gogh Night Cafe, where we have uh, 
This series of more relevant terms, Van Gogh, color, night, table. Um, upon clicking on each one of these tiles, sort of the visualization would change into what we see on the right side. Say we click in color, then the new tree map would be for, the, for color. Uh, and instead of having attributes inside of the, each tile, we would see the actual works of art. Uh, this would enable a visitor to go very rigorous, rigorously from one piece to an attribute, and then either going back to the piece to look at other attributes, or moving on to the next piece that he would like to visit in the gallery. Now, moving forward, the, um, right now we are taking a very sort of, we're thinking about the visitor. Uh, our goal is for him to see the gallery in a new way. But this could also potentially turn into something that is a bit more academic. And um, I think for a later stage of the project, our goal will be to see how these tags can be traced back to their original uh, essay or to their original curatorial file. And so the visitor can actually, in front of the piece, see why is religious important for the Rothko. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. We'd now like to welcome Roger Pellegrini, or I'm sorry, totally got that wrong, um, Stephanie Acevedo. Uh, hi, my name is Stephanie. I'm a fourth year PhD student in music theory, and today I'm going to talk about my dissertation project. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background where this project comes from, um, in music theory there's currently uh, emergence or re-emergence of what people call schema theory, and um, it's very specifically used to talk about a specific type of abstraction of uh, classical or what I call, or what we call common practice musical tonality. Um, so you can see an example of it here where you have this um, diagram of the well-known Romanesca. Um, and so each oval presents a chordal event and it has some information about metrical position, about the melodic lines, and what chord, type of chords would be uh, played. And here, so this little musical example is going to play the Romanesca, and then a very common use of the Romanesca, which most of you will probably recognize if I don't accidentally click ahead. So that was a snippet of Pachelbel's canon. Um, so my dissertation um, is interested in looking at historical practice, or uh, historical listening, but then um, kind of uh, getting rid of the temporal and geographical gra uh, gap that would, ex uh, that would arise from studying common practice or classical music. And of course, I can't put an 18th century listener into an EEG uh, cap and study them, so I have to deal with modern listeners. The problem with modern listeners is that we don't just listen to classical music, we also listen to a wide variety of musics, um, pop, rock, whatever, right? Um, so my, my study is actually looking at popular music harmonies and um, also interested in how those re might relate or be similar or different to classical music harmonies. Um, I have two phases. The first phase is a corpus analysis of uh, popular music to really get at the statistical uh, kind of background of what you know what what the harmonies of this corpus are, and then a phase two, which would be an uh, EEG and experimental component. So the first phase, which is what I'm focusing on right now, is a corpus analysis of the McGill Billboard Corpus, which is a sample of uh, the top 100 uh, hits, Billboard chart hits, um, from 1958 to 1991. And this gives me a wide array of not only genre, but also types of music that we may not even know anymore. Um, I've listened to a lot of them and I'm like, I've never heard the song before, but then there's also really, really popular songs. And basically, 
the, the assumption is that a lot of this music represents kind of an ambient tonality, an ambient type of uh, pattern and harmonic schemata that arise um, and have po possibly influenced uh, even musics that we might listen to now or that are popular now. Um, so the corpus is, contains 890 songs, and this is a snapshot of what the text file would look like for this song. It's just chords, but there's some metrical information, and there's also taggings for uh, formal parameters like introduction, verse, chorus, and so forth. Um, so the first stage right now, um, I'm looking at progressions using entropy. So this is using uh, information theory. And for those of you that are not familiar with entropy, uh, basically, I'm um, looking at probability. Uh, entropy is inversely related to probability. So what I'm doing is I'm looking at sequences of chords and finding spikes in entropy or troughs in probability and delineating segments based on those troughs. Um, and using that, I can find recurrent patterns uh, where there's a level of uncertainty that marks a segmentation. Um, so just to give you an example of the type of thing that I'm finding, um, right now I found 705 distinct progressions. Um, these unique progressions actually occur a total of 26,000 times in the corpus. Uh, keep in mind that some of them might be redundant. Um, or just variants of a similar thing. Uh, for example, one of the most common things that I found, this occurs almost 500 times, it's a sequence of seven chords and X, Y, Z relate to the, or so X would be the same thing, um, Y would be a, a different major triad in this case, and Z would be a different major triad. Uh, the orange shows the relative distance between uh, the root of these chords. So as you can see, you have uh, the distance between X and Y would be, uh, it's a perfect fifth, um, and then Y and Z would be a minor seventh. Um, so this is just an abstraction of a possible instantiation for those of you that are familiar with music Roman numeral analysis, we might have a 1541 progression as seen here. I can further abstract this into a three element loop. So as you can see, X, Y, Z would repeat again, and then I would exit the loop in the little black arrow. What this tells me is, um, Patterns of expectation, repetition, how many times does this loop repeat? And then I can create, uh, based on this analysis, I can create stimuli for phase two, which would be my experimental setup. Um, I haven't gotten here quite yet, but this is just kind of a mock up of what it would look like. Um, there's a lot of research done uh, by Stefan Kolsch's lab in Germany of uh, EEG experiments where they try to find. Um, ERP components based on syntactic deviations in classical music. So this is an example of what their stimuli look like. A normative progression would look like the one on the top where you're presented with a stimulus of say one, four, two, five, one, but then a deviation, a syntactic deviation would be something like you see in the bottom where the chord, uh, the last final one chord would be replaced with a two chord. And this creates what we call an ERAN, so an early right anterior negativity um, in the brain, which is a signal of surprise. Um, so basically what I would do is once I find my statistical, uh, uh, once I finish my statistical analysis, uh, instead of using these common practice progressions, I would use a popular, uh, a popular progression for my stimuli. I also want to look at um, uniqueness measures and familiarity, familiarity measures for the McGill, the songs in the McGill corpus and see if there's correlations there too. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephanie. So from medieval manuscripts to art galleries to music, it's natural to move on to poetry. So I'd like to introduce Roger Pellegrini. Hi everyone, my name is Roger Pellegrini and I'm a senior English major in the creative writing concentration. For my senior project, I'm writing a long poem that's partially written by a neural network 
or very basically an artificial intelligence program that's been trained on American poetry. Yeah. <laughs> So if you'll indulge me with a little audience participation, I'd like to begin my talk with kind of a game, poet or program. One of these was written by a robot, and another one was written by a human. Um, so take a few seconds to read in the samples, and then let me, sh uh, let me know by a show of hands which you think is the robot. And if you've heard the human poem before, no cheating. All right, so who thinks that the first one is the robot? Show of hands. OK. And who thinks the second one is the robot? All right, all right. There's a little confusion, but I couldn't trip you up. First one was the robot, and the second one was Emily Dickinson. Uh, before we move on from this one, I think it is worthy to note, though, that uh, the robot did learn to rhyme. <laughs> So, <laughs> all right, poet or program? I don't know if this one will be harder or easier, but. People are still looking. All right, who thinks that the first one is the robot? And who thinks the second one is the robot? I got you. <laughs> yeah, that was, that's from Song of Myself. And last one, longest one, but quick reading, lightning reading. This is a lightning talk, so. Okay. So maybe you haven't had time to read it all, but <laughs> who thinks the first one is the robot? Second one is the robot? All right. So that was kind of just a fun little thing, but I think there are some things that we can take away from this. Uh, so the most human things are usually thought to be the most difficult to encode, but as we just saw, this kind of artistic context can allow for a lot of wiggle room, um, just because of you know how much is allowable in art. Now, the point of my project isn't to fool people, even though that is fun. Um, I'm more interested in you know investigating when the program does fall short, and you know, in what does make human-generated writing human. Uh, and I think this is particularly important because not only are there programs that sound like humans, but there are also humans that sound like programs. <laughs> and I don't mean that to demean Gertrude Stein in any way, but just to say that, you know, you're lucky that I didn't put this up there for the game, because I think that really would have tripped you up, right? Um, so, given that, the question that my project tries to address or investigate is what happens when an unusual human voice is presented as human, and what happens in bringing the reader towards the program rather than in bringing the program towards the reader? And when does the program fall short? And when can, you know, we kind of assert our humanity, <laughs> in a sense. Uh, so just to take a step back, and give you a sense of how I arrived at my project. I started off by doing some kind of preliminary experiments with Song of Myself because it was not under copyright and I like Walt Whitman. Uh, if you'd like to go to my lovely website and find out more about them, feel free to. Um, but the, the first kind of experiment I did was just a random reordering of 14 lines from Song of Myself and then the second one was a two gram model of Song of Myself. Uh, and particularly this past summer with kind of the Google Deep Dream uh, neural network hype explosion, <laughs> uh, I got interested in taking it a step further and uh, trying to look at American poetry as a whole and to see you know, what can be gleaned from it as a whole. 
Um, I used some very convenient, very free code from Andre Carpathy uh, to create a character level recurrent neural network. So this computer program is taking in a huge swath of American poetry and learning it character by character and reproducing it character by character rather than word by word uh, to create output that is structurally similar to American poetry. Uh, in terms of my methods and materials, the just getting the material to train the network on was a huge task. And it was really, you know, up to what was not in copyright and what I could sort of attain semi-legally. <laughs> As a result, the neural network was trained on over a third John Ashbery, <laughs> which probably doesn't do much for its coherence. <laughs> but <laughs> it's what I was stuck with. Um, then to talk about a bit about my process, the most important parameter after creating the network and to create the output was the temperature variation. Uh, in very simple terms, varying the temperature determines kind of how closely the output will stick to uh, what it's been given. Uh, so in just visceral terms, a lower temperature, it's kind of colder, it's more conservative, and it will produce something extremely structurally similar to what has been given, whereas a higher temperature will be a little bit more chaotic uh, and give more diversity and also more mistakes. To give you some samples of the output, uh, just given different temperatures, uh, with a temperature of one, very chaotic, you can see it makes a lot of spelling mistakes. The helves of lecture pink, I don't know what that means. Uh, at a temperature of 0.7, we kind of get towards something that's a little bit more coherent. But very interestingly, and this held true across all of the neural networks that I created, a temperature of almost zero produced consistently this phrase over and over again. <laughs> Which, you know, might tie back to the pictures of Hal earlier. It's, it's full of stars. Um, I haven't really come to terms with that yet, but that's another project. Typically, I took something like a temperature of 0.7 and then kind of pruned it a little bit and gave it a little bit of help before inserting it into uh, my larger poetic project. Uh, so here you can see I've kind of made it grammatical almost. It doesn't really make much sense, but you know, that's really what I set out to explore. Um, so in the end, the neural network kind of just excelled in moments. It had a couple of really nice phrases, angels despair to the stars, why I soon do nothing but begin, and my personal favorite, my spirit was left prisoner to the special states of metaphysical languages. <laughs> I think we've all been there. Um, however, in the long run, the neural network kind of lacked an overarching structure, kind of an arc to what it was saying. Um, and it had a lot of many, a lot of, you know, the X of the Y of the Z of the A, and it would often just go on like that for a while, <laughs> which is, you know, a funny uh, impression of poetry. Um, but for certain brief moments, uh, kind of with human help, I was able to use it as a believable, different, dependable other voice in my project. And, uh, you know, this will be up to the readers of my thesis, but I think that in the end, it ended up making my own voice sound more human. So, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Roger. Uh, Michael Weaver is next. Hi, my name's Michael Weaver. Um, I'm a political, uh, PhD candidate in political science. I'm here to talk to you a little bit about some of my work for my dissertation uh, on public discourses about, about lynching in the, in the United States. So uh, this project starts with a bit of a historical puzzle. I think most people don't realize the extent to which lynching was widely publicly supported uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century. Uh, Southern newspapers routinely, openly defended and praised the practice, and when they didn't, used implicit language that dehumanized the victims, presumed their guilt, and presented the mob as an agent of popular sovereignty. 
And actually, many northern papers picked up a lot of the same language and repeated it again and again. Here we have an example from the New York Times doing just that. But by the 1920s and 1930s, things had changed uh, quite drastically, such that uh, victims are no longer dehumanized, the press questioned their guilt, um, and importantly, mob, the mob was criticized, and more than that, the press um, really skewered political officials and police officers that, that failed to intervene and, and stop the mob and thus to uphold the law. Um, and so my research tries to address the question of how did this transformation uh, in public acceptability of violence occur? Um, I'm not going to give you a full answer today. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about one of the answers I come up with in my dissertation, which relates to publicity, and in particular the role that changing technologies, particularly for communication, played a role in creating new forms of publicity for lynching. So at the turn of the 19th and 20th century, there's a massive expansion in both transportation networks, such as railroads, communication networks like the telegraph and telephone, and also news services like the Associated Press. Uh, so here's an example of railroad stations in 1880 across the United States. And by 1910, it's become much, much denser. And at the same time, you see similar changes in the telegraph. So for instance, um, uh, this is the growth in telegraph lines operated by Western Union over the same period of time, it, it nearly uh, quintuples. Um, all of this served to make the country much smaller. Uh, this reduced travel times for both people and information, and also created a, a new national public that was eager to consume news at, at, at a national level. Um, what this meant is that the, the publicity of lynchings uh, was much greater and reached a much greater and, and more geographically dispersed audience. So why does that matter? So I argue that by, by bringing news about lynching and more generally about certain types of violence to a wider audience, um, you break news of lynching free from the locality in which, which, it would, would occur, which it occurred, which means first that the perpetrators lose control over their narratives about violence. So in fact, prior to this period of time, um, most national news stories about lynching were in fact written by the local newspaper editors of where the event occurred. That's where the wire services got their stories. Uh, as these networks become denser, these, these local actors have less and less control over the stories they tell about the violence perpetrated in their communities. At the same time, uh, this, this news reaches new audiences uh, particularly, particularly in the North and, and in the West that were less sympathetic to lynchers. They didn't necessarily buy into the, the social structure that upheld lynching as, as, a, as a form of basically labor repression and, and racial repression in the South. Um, at the same time, uh, news reaching broader audiences gave new opportunities and sites for criticism. Uh, in the South, it was actually very dangerous to criticize lynching. Uh, African Americans who criticized lynching could be violently threatened or killed, and even white opponents of lynching could be run, run out of town or at least have their homes ransacked or, or vandalized. And so this new form of new opportunities for criticism uh, ultimately meant that lynching events could become national scandals. Um, so that's my, part of my argument. In short, how do I go about testing this? And so this is where I think I fit into this digital humanities con uh, um, workshop. Um, so basically, I've collected a lot of data to try to get a sense of both the changing technological uh, advances at the time, as well as how lynching is talked about in the press. So the most important part of this project is a sense in which we're bringing big data to history. I'm working with several uh, digitized historical newspaper archives, uh, which encompass well over 3,000 different newspapers with a nationwide wide coverage ranging from big city dailies that you'd recognize, like the New York, New York Times, Washington Post, Chicago Tribune, down to small town weeklies for in counties you've never heard of. Um, all over the country. And in, in total, this, this corpus of text includes 8 million plus issues of newspapers, and it's constantly growing between a period of 1880 and 1940. And the greatest thing about this is because this has been, this has been digitized, we're able actually to search this content. So uh, for instance, I'm going to show you some, some results working with about 1.2 million articles that make explicit mention of lynching. Um, just to give you a sense of what this data look like, this is a sample over time. As you can see, it's quite broad across the entire country. Um, this is just an example of what daily press coverage of lynching looks like. Each time there's a bubble that's press mentions of lynching, the larger the bubble, the more, lynch, the more press coverage there is in that place. And you can see the sort of temporal and geo, geo, uh, geographic patterns in which you see just really the whole country light up as an event catalyzes the nation. Uh, at the same time, I've also worked to collect data on railroad networks. Um, I have yearly data between 1880 and 1900 on connections between counties. I'm hoping to extend that forward to 1911. Uh, this is a period of rapid growth in which railroads basically double in length during this time. And I'm able to calculate the centrality of counties to railroad networks as well as travel time between them. Uh, just to give you an example, this is a travel time from New Haven County to the rest of the country in 1880. 
Uh, and again, in 1900, you can see the reduction in travel time. And this is even more extreme for places like uh, Western Arkansas or Eastern, Mis uh, yeah, Eastern Arkansas and Western Mississippi, uh, where you see a lot of lynchings. Um, these changes can happen much more. Um, so what do I find? So in short, um, I test three major implications of this argument. Uh, first, I want to see that you should see that um, lynching is more likely to be covered in the press when the distance between the lynching and the paper decreases. I find that, in fact, what happens as you get further away, you're much less likely to have coverage. Uh, you should also see that um, the lynching is more likely to be covered as travel times decrease. So even though uh, geographic distance can provide some sort of anonymity for lynchers, um, more or less I find that, these, that reductions in travel time almost exactly offset um, the effects of distance, almost, like, almost perfectly, uh, and then the coefficients on, on these models. Um, you also should expect to see that uh, you're going to see more coverage of lynchings when they occur in areas that are more central like communication and transportation networks. And so using two different measures of network centrality, we find that uh, 10 is the highest decile. Basically increasing uh, network centrality means you're more likely to be covered um, under both two, two major conceptions of centrality. Um, so that's kind of key first step uh, evidence for my argument. Um, so what's next for this project? So the next big question is, does publicity, in fact, produce more criticism? Um, one way to do this is look at keywords and phrases that correspond to various pro- and anti-lynching discourses, uh, which I've done, um, and basically examine those geographic patterns. I haven't had a chance to do that geographically, but temporally, we can see a major shift over time, and particularly during the height of the NAACP's anti-lynching campaign from 1919 to about 1924. Um, and one thing I can look at in terms of geographic dimensions of coverage, we should expect to see that the press coverage of lynching is more critical when the paper is further away from the lynching, particularly in a place without a history or culture of lynching. Um, next, expanding this data, um, besides just looking at how well connected your county is, we actually think it matters how close you are to actual railroad stations or to actual telegraph offices. Um, so I've been working to geocode the exact location of lynching events, as well as to transcribe and geocode the locations of railroad stations and telegraph stations from around the 1880s the 1910, 1920s, and part of this project involves create, I mean, working with a grant from the DH lab to create a website that will facilitate the crowdsourcing of the transcription of both, uh, of both of these types of data. This is an example of what these pages look like. Um, I've got a lot of them that I was able to, to scan with the help of the library, uh, and so it will be a project in which people can help transcribe all of these, and the idea will ultimately create maps that will automatically update once people have transcribed a new location, it'll be geocoded, and added to a map like this, which right now only has two endpoints. In the end, we'll have a full time series of, of where railroads were and ultimately where telegraph offices were during this time frame. Um, so that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael. And now on to Grace Pedagorsky. My name is Grace Pedagorski, and I'm a senior in Yale College and a computer science major. My project was a, com I, uh, sorry, a computational analysis of images in the Vogue magazine archive, which is available to anybody uh, within the Yale community as a collection in the Yale library digitally. So when I first found out that the computer graphics lab um, actually had access to this database. I started thinking about what could this huge database of over 400,000 color photographs and more photographs from before that over Vogue's enormous history, uh, how those images could be used to study uh, some sociological trend that followed from uh, things that appear in graphical media. So, first of all, a little bit of background about why Vogue. Vogue is a very old institution in the scheme of American magazines. It's very influential in the world of fashion. It's been around for close to 125 years, and it's been printing in color for quite a while. Uh, I chose the, start, I, the starting point for my analysis uh, in the year 1942 because that was about when I was starting to see 
predominantly color or low color images, but not predominantly black and white images. Uh, the specific, uh, the specific metric that I decided to try to analyze over the course of the magazine's history was the skin tones of people that appeared within the magazine, uh, both in advertisements and in the fashion photography of the magazine. My hope was to be able to draw conclusions regarding how the types of people by skin tone who appeared in the magazine could be related, uh, first of all, to our, our cultural standards of beauty, who seemed at different time periods to be acceptable to put in a magazine that was supposed to be showing beauty. And beyond that, how, especially in advertising, how the way that people were portrayed, the way that people were photographed, might either perpetuate or challenge stereotypes. So, my initial reading before beginning the project showed that, particularly in advertising, there are some racial biases that definitely exist up till the present day uh, in who is depicted how in advertisements. The studies that I read specifically talked about women in advertisements. Essentially, white women could be depicted in pretty much any context and pretty much any kind of <coughs> advertisement. Uh, they could be shown being confident, happy in a family setting. They could be shown to look attractive, sexy even, given the context. And women of color were usually not applied to the same range of, uh, the same range of different types of portrayals. Uh, black and Latina women were often posed in ways that were relatively, uh, in poses that did not look powerful, that might even look submissive. Uh, and Asian American women were often depicted in ways that seemed professional, but somewhat, somewhat lacking in depictions of family life and life outside of a career that uh, could be found in depictions of white women. Essentially, my project was to use computational methods to try to find patterns in the skin tones that appeared in different issues of the magazine over the 71 years that I chose to study uh, from 1942 through December 2012. And the way that I did this relied on, uh, relied on some fundamental principles of how images are represented for computers. Basically, the way an image is represented is based on a color profile. One of the particularly common ones is RGB, or red, green, blue. Basically three values that show how much red, how much green, and how much blue should be in any one given pixel, with a set of values for each pixel in an image. Uh, in order to look specifically at skin tone, because a set of hues would be difficult uh, to quantify as corresponding to exact uh, skin tones of people of different races. I honed in on a transformation of the RGB color profile, uh, hue saturation value color, which it still represents the same types of colors, but one of the, uh, the key difference is that the three values it uses, the first defines what color is being shown, the second defines essentially how much of the color, that's saturation, and the third value is basically the brightness. So, I looked at saturation of skin within the images that I looked at in the Vogue magazine archive. So, my first task was following up on a previous project by Christiana Wong, 
with uh, my advisor, Dr. Holly Rushmeyer. Um, I took a face detection algorithm that Christy had successfully applied to the Vogue archive and used that to move in on my real goal, isolating areas of skin within the images. So the image here, I used a procedure called k-means segmentation to um, split the image based on um, the way that colors were grouped. So that the top image is a sum of the three images shown below it. Basically, my goal was to be able to use k-means segmentation and then choose a single image uh, to isolate the skin tones within that. In this case, that would be the middle image, although this led into the primary challenge I saw in actually getting accurate results. It's relatively difficult for a computer to tell what is and is not skin. In this photo, the particular challenge was that the model was photographed in front of a background that was similar to her skin color. Uh, in photographs with, say, a pure white background, the results would probably be a lot uh, easier to visualize, easier to say. One of these is skin, particularly, and the other two are not. But uh, in going forward with this research, the main pieces that would need to be improved in order to get results that could actually have statistical, uh, statistical significance and uh, could lead toward actual sociological commentary about standards of beauty or racial representation are, uh, first of all, managing things like the background and uh, text overlays, which were pretty common in photographs from the magazine. And second, finding a way to choose among the segments of the images more definitively which one had skin and which one did not. I found that saturation was a pretty good uh, means of judging the skin tone of a person in a photo, but because of the complicating factors I mentioned, particularly background colors and uh, text overlays, I wasn't, at the end of the fall semester, able to produce any kind of particular conclusive results. However, hopefully this will be the beginning of some future work uh, on the Vogue magazine archive, and hopefully my data will be a good starting point for uh, future researchers who can examine this in greater depth. Thank you. Thanks very much, Grace. And finally, um, Stephanie Valencia. Uh, hello. Um, it is so great to be here. Um, I got really excited about this symposium because I've always had this like two like worlds in my um, career that's like art and engineering. And I found that they come together really nicely when we talk about how can we design for people of all abilities. So uh, I work at the Technology and Innovation Lab at the Yale Child Study Center. And we explore how we can increase uh, the well-being of people living with autism spectrum disorders. But I've also done some work regarding like other disabilities. So first, uh, well, I would, like to, I would like to ask you this question. Who can tell me, for example, the answer to this question? I know it's very simple, but if someone wants to answer it, <laughs> I'll be happy. Five, OK. <laughs> can somebody tell me if there's another answer around this question? Yes? Very true. So there's not only one answer to this question, and it all depends on how you look at it, right? And sometimes when we have a problem, like how can we uh, design for people who are blind? Or how can we make um, an image accessible for people who are blind? Or how can we um, communicate emotion uh, to someone who is deaf and blind? Or how can we communicate different things? The problems increase in complexity and there are many answers. 
Some of the uh, uh, questions can be, for example, how can we teach the color theory to people with visual impairments or teach them about graphic literacy? And how can we even understand how different uh, people with autism spectrum disorders recognize emotion? So there's different tools that have been really helpful for me. For example, the design thinking approach. The design thinking approach uh, can be a process of problem solving. Through this, um, well, researchers in the design area try to ask many questions, do observations, and different exercises that promote like divergent thinking to then do an analysis of that and then a synthesis. And it goes, it is a really like long process of diverging and converging and trying to come up with a solution for these uh, questions. And then it brings uh, two disciplines together that normally confront each other. For example, engineering and art. In engineering, engineers are more used to problem solving thinking. How can we make, okay, how can we solve this? And maybe in art, we allow a more playful exploration of this. But they have a meeting point. A normal uh, case uh, illustration of this is, for example, in the prosthetic, prosthetics world, um, engineers have different approaches where they examine biomechanics and it is very important uh, to know that this is functional. But then in art, you can ask yourself, how does a prosthetic uh, piece be part of the identity of the person and how does this like, change or gives meaning to their lives? This is something they're wearing, then how can this um, be like significant and how can this be tailored to embrace different attitudes? So the challenge of disability is that there are different ways we have to communicate information because not everybody has the same approach to the environment and they have different sensing abilities. And this is uh, important when we talk about uh, literature, art, and also inclusion. So um, in the middle of these two disciplines, I find that we have uh, the ability to make things. So engineering brings the problem solving part, art brings the playful exploration, and they both meet in what it is like a creation of products. So I just wanted to talk briefly uh, just to get you started about this thinking about um, inclusion, accessibility, and disability in three different examples that have uh, been important through my career. So I first wanted to explore how can we talk about color in different ways. And this was with the population that have different uh, visual abilities. And I was thinking, well, how can we bring the color conversation to them? And I don't know if it's gonna be uncomfortable, it's gonna be okay, a very naive approach. But then I um, started researching with an artist called Constanza Bonilla, and we came up with this system that uses geometric uh, shapes to teach the color theory. So for example, uh, we have the primary colors, yellow, red, and blue, and yellow um, as can be straight lines like the sun's rays, there's like some composition behind the choosing. We have um, blue can be like waves like the ocean, and then we can have green would be the straight line in a wave. So then this can uh, lay the foundation for different types of expression and of sharing art through touch. Another example is a project where I use the human-centered design like a method that concentrates on the user to generate a product. The question was, how can we increase graphic literacy in children with visual impairments? So through a lot of playing with them and looking at how they grab objects and how they play, we came up with different prototypes that I can tell you more about it later. And finally, with this like sensory toy box, where they can explore different pieces and hear sounds about them. And this is a, like a very rough prototype, but it was done with the kids, and it is very rich to um, like include everybody when you're making something. And a final example of this is in our lab at the at Thiel. Uh, we also explore social robotics. And we were exploring with Sphero that this is like a commercial uh, robot 
how could we depict different emotions through like movements, lights, and sounds, and see how the child's reacted to the different combinations of emotions. And it was really interesting. Uh, children who were, who were typically developed and children with autism reacted differently when the robot got mad, when we depicted sadness, and it was really nice to explore this because then the question is, how can we also um, translate emotion? What does emotion mean to different people? And all of these are playful explorations that could turn into interesting products or interesting interventions. And I'll leave you with this, um, one of my favorite quotes. It's about a designer uh, called Graham Pulling, and he says that the issues around disability are underexplored and that we really need uh, truly like interdisciplinary design thinking, combining and blurring design craft with engineering, therapeutic excellence, and the experience of disabled people. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Stephanie, and just thanks to every one of our lightning panelists. I'd just like to give all of you a round of applause, all excellent, very interesting projects.